Honourable Chair and thank you, Honourable Members. Um, it's a privilege to be here and I, I greatly appreciate the, the invitation. Um, I'd like to present uh, on a report that was published earlier this year um, and the findings of that particular report. If you bear with me for one second, let me just get a PowerPoint up. If you can see that. Yes, we can. The landscape of fear, All right. crime, and murder. Thank you. All right. So um, just to briefly, before I, before I get started, explain the, the alphabet soup to the right of the screen. Um, I, I work for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, it's a civil society organization which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. It's been in existence for around 10 years, working on issues of organized crime uh, around the world. Uh, we have around 100 staff in various observatories. I head up our East and Southern Africa Observatory. Uh, there are two other African observatories, one in West Africa, one in North Africa and the Sahel. We're also supported by uh, an expert group of around 500 people drawn from academia, law enforcement, uh, judiciary and, and uh, the development worlds. Um, and the global initiative on this particular project is partnered with the Institute of Security Studies and Interpol. That partnership uh, sees the, uh, the work done by the Enact Africa project. And the Enact Africa project is implemented by those groups to try and uh, build knowledge and develop skills to enhance the continent's abilities to combat organized crime. Um, and it's, it's funded by the European Union, which has placed security in Africa um, high up on its agenda uh, through its Pan-African program. So now that we've got that out of the way, uh, let me move on to the presentation itself. Um, we'll be speaking today a lot about crime. And I think that it's what we tried to do with this report, what I tried to do with this report, was to take a step back from the focus area around Kruger and poaching on Kruger. Um, so much has been written over the years by myself included where there's been a very narrow focus on, on the Kruger National Park, the poaching that's occurring within the Kruger uh, issues around the so-called war on poaching. Um, and I think that what we set out to do here was to take a step back, look at Mpumalanga holistically and look at some of the issues in Mpumalanga, um, a province that is uniquely situated in South Africa, given its, its um, access to various borders, uh, given the fact that it surrounds the southern part of the, of the park and the so-called intensive protection zone where uh, many of the park's last rhino populations are left. Um, the first slide there is a, a slide that was taken, an image taken from uh, an armed robbery at a business mall in Bushbuck Ridge. And you're probably wondering why I'm putting that up. But I think that it exemplifies in many ways the challenges that we're dealing with in Mpumalanga, but also the challenges that we're dealing with in organized crime more broadly in South Africa. Uh, this was an incident in February this year. Uh, the police issued a press statement the following day saying that there'd been an incident uh, in which uh, a number of suspects had caused a stir uh, during a business robbery at the Dwarslip Mall in Bushbuck Ridge. It was only a few paragraphs down that you learned that there were 30 armed suspects carrying handguns and rifles who stormed the mall in the early hours of the morning, used explosives to gain access to cash and safes, blew up ATM machines, attacked a casino and blew up uh, slot machines in that casino, raided a PEP home store and a PEP clothing store, raided a liquor store and a cell phone store and made off. Uh, the police station in that area is seven kilometers away from where this incident occurred. Um, keeping with that long view of, of crime, um, and I think that the most important aspect here, and this is looking at South Africa, uh, and this is extracted, by the way, from our strategic organized crime assessment on South Africa, which I've made available to the committee, along with the, the report that I'm speaking about. Um, we've always had high levels of violence in South Africa, but what's important to note here is that um, our first democratic elections in 1994 saw a dramatic reduction in murder rates. Some of that can be attributed to the so-called peace dividend uh, in, in the moments after the election, um, as some of the violence that had been raging for a number of years across the country uh, dissipated, but also the implementation of things like the Firearms Control Act, which, and, and which was at the time you had um, a, a high-functioning central firearms registry, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, that saw nearly 50% decline in murder. And we use murder because it's an accurate way of assessing levels of violence within, within a society. Around 2011-12, we begin to see an uptick in those figures across the country, and then a 38% increase in murder rates across South Africa in 10 years. It's closer to a 40% increase by now. Um, much of that's been attributed to law enforcement institutional weaknesses. There's also an increase in vigilante action in many communities uh, that are grappling with organized crime and issues around armed robbery, and where all too often law enforcement is absent or, or ineffective. Um, and it's also key in terms of things like violent robbery, but as I'll mention later, issues around cash and transit heists, ATM bombings, and so on and so forth. Now, what sets Mpumalanga apart in some ways is that it is one of the, the few rural provinces that has Mr. seen... Mr. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we, can. We, can. yes we, can. we can. We can hear you. I think it might be an issue with the chairperson's signal. Okay. I'll just pause for a second there. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? We can hear you, in Mr. Radha. We will okay, make in the, in, in, the in, All right, in the interest of time, I'll continue. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so if we look at, at uh, Mpumalanga, it's in a, in a fairly unique position among provinces in South Africa, where it's seen a 42% increase in murder rates over 10 years. That, uh, as you can see, Gauteng, uh, which is particularly high rates in, in violent crime, has also seen a 42% increase over that period. And those provinces, the Western Cape, 46%, uh, and KwaZulu-Natal are the, are the two highest. Um, which is, is quite worrying if you consider that, you know, Mpumalanga is, um, is, is in that cluster of provinces with such high levels of violent crime. But another aspect which is very important to, to mention, and the slide is quite convoluted, I'm not going to go into too much detail, other than to emphasize that South Africa is in the unique position among African countries. And this is measured in um, a uh, organized crime index, which we produce uh, globally every two years, and an Africa index, which we produce together with the ENACT project, um, where we try to measure levels of organized crime across countries, but we also try to measure the levels of resilience within those countries. Um, and what, what, is, what this research shows, and you can have a look at the, the document itself, is that South Africa is in a unique position while our resilience is growing increasingly fragile, we still have comparatively high levels of resilience compared to most African countries, uh, but we also have extremely high levels of, of criminality. And criminal markets, uh, where you have a range of activities from sort of mafia style groups to issues around smuggling of arms, uh, human trafficking, human smuggling, um, our, our linkages into the international drugs trade, and obviously issues around wildlife crime. Within that context, um, the Kruger, and that's the, the, the study area of this report in the map on the right there, uh, from Acorn Hook down and then across to, to Kamati Port with some, some extension into the Barberton area. Um, the Kruger exists in what, what we've termed uh, a landscape of fear, and we argue that the gravest threat face, facing the Kruger National Park and the greater Kruger area today is not poaching, but internal corruption. But it's important not to just focus only on the corruption. It's the drivers of corruption that we need to look at, and I'll come back to those. But also the criminal networks that have become entrenched in and around that area um, over the years. And much of that has to do with with uh, the issues around law enforcement that I highlighted earlier. Um, so the Kruger is not some kind of insulated wildlife paradise. And I think any, you know, all of you on this call know that. Um, but I think that for many people out there, it seems to, it fits that mold. Um, and the struggles that it's, it's dealing with mirrors South Africa's broader struggles with organized crime. 
Um, the Kruger exists in a rapidly urbanizing landscape where criminal economies and violent local and transnational networks are embedded and evolving. Um, you can see that with kidnapping networks, cash and transit heists, drug trafficking that, that transits through there, uh, human smuggling, um, ATM bombings. We've seen an uptick in assassinations, which I'll come back to. There's deep-seated inequality, and I'll touch on that in a bit more detail. Um, and, and crime and corruption have a profound impact on the greater Kruger region and the people who live in it and around the park. And that includes the Kruger Nationals Park, uh, the Kruger staff. Um, the Kruger employs around 2,500 staff. It supports around 4,500 jobs in communities around the park. Um, there are 400 field rangers. 86% of them live in villages and towns around the park. And they're particularly vulnerable in, in, that, in that way because they're is, uh, you know, aside from the risks that they face within the park in, in trying to deal with, with poaching and, and um, other issues related to that, when they go home, they're also vulnerable to approaches from criminal networks. Um, and there are very few places for people to turn. Uh, you know, if you spent your 23 days on, you head home, uh, you have criminal networks making direct approaches and sometimes, you know, not even subtle approaches, saying, for instance, you know, when you're not here and you're working in the park, we know where your children go to school and we know where your wife is um, and putting immense pressure on people. Um, we've seen that uh, organized crime certainly poses an existential threat to communities in that area. And that's particularly related to the violence. And we come back to the murder rate. But we've also seen uh, worrying issues, you know, for instance, the, the murder of a German tourist at Numbi Gate, the subsequent shootings of two security guards who were put in uh, position there to keep an eye on that entrance. We've seen the murder of Anton Mzimba, uh, the head ranger at Tumbavati, uh, whose murder has yet to be resolved, despite the fact that there are leads on suspects. Uh, we've seen the murder of Colonel Leroy Brevere, uh, who was assassinated while investigating rhino poaching networks in the Kruger National Park. Again, no one has been uh, charged, or I mean, no one has been tried for that crime. Um, and we've seen other murders more recently. I mentioned the case of, of Chief Clyde Amnesi, uh, who was implicated in involvement in, uh, in networks involved in poaching and organized crime around the Kruger National Park. Um, and the subsequent as, uh, assassination, it seems to be in a, an internal family dispute, but the subsequent assassination murder of his, of his widow. Um, so all of those complexities come, come together. Um, so if we look at this issue, and I've turned it a governance void, where you have a growing community living in and around the Kruger National Park, you have around 2.9 million people within 50 kilometers of the Kruger's boundary fence, according to Statis in 2019. That figure is probably likely closer to 4 million today. Average unemployment is around 46%. Um, and you know, in research that's been done around the park, the Kruger's aesthetic beauty, while it might appeal to tourists, has very little relevance to communities living around that park and, and living in conditions where they are struggling. Um, the Kruger itself is struggling with a historic legacy that molded over a century. We can go back to the impact of Africana nationalism, apartheid, forced removals around their structural racism, which continues to bedevil efforts to, to try and remold and restructure the park. Stan Parks has worked hard in trying to attract black South African tourists to the park. But the simple fact remains that black South Africans make up 28% of all sand parks guests, and they only make up around 12% of overnight guests in that park. Um, poverty, inequality, unemployment are key drivers of crime. Uh, we've seen areas, again, as I say, where there's an absence of law enforcement, either because law enforcement is disinterested, too corrupt, or too inefficient, where there's an absence of, of uh, real change in communities. Um, and that has an impact and it, it allows for the uh, for criminal networks to entrench themselves, but it also allows for parallel illicit economies uh, to grow and metastasize. And there's also um, instances where communities have been tarred as poachers, uh, where they are subjected to heavy handed anti poaching operations, which itself has has led to deeper divisions. Um, if we look at the impact, and I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but between 2011 and 2020, the Kruger's right, white rhino population fell by 75%. What we've seen in the Kruger is this low-level, seemingly unending 
so-called war on poaching, as it's all too often erroneously termed. Um, and But if you look at it within that context, this is a 15-year low-level conflict. This is long as the wars of independence in Angola and Mozambique, uh, the Bush War in Rhodesia, or the Lebanese Civil War. Um, the military strategy uh, is has been largely unsuccessful. We've seen declining populations. We've seen continued poaching. Um, it's come at enormous psychological and, and physical impact. There's been a severe breakdown in trust, staff cohesion, and professionalism within the park as a result. You know, for instance, when you're seeing millions being spent on uh, this nebulous war on poaching, and yet the facilities in which rangers have to live are not being improved. That has a significant impact on, on morale. Um, there are well-founded fears that there are significantly high levels of corruption within the park. Some people speculate around 40% of staff may be involved in some way, um, either by uh, assisting syndicates with information or more directly, uh, smuggling weapons into the park, that kind of thing. We know that in one section of the park, at least 14 out of 20 rangers have been implicated in corruption. Um, a financial investigation and, uh, and, a, and an impressive financial investigation, which has been done by DPCI, supported by KPMG, the auditing firm, uh, through donor funding, bringing in Sandparks and Kruger investigators, plus also bringing in the NPA, has identified around 50 suspects so far. Um, and it's an investigation which unfortunately at the moment doesn't have funding to continue, but it has resulted in 16 arrests. And those 16 arrests have had a, a, a had an almost overnight impact in driving down poaching. And one in one particular area of the park where some of the early arrests took place, there was not a poaching incident for three months. Um, I think it's fair to say, and certainly we we make this point in the report that there is a refreshing openness within the Kruger, but also within Sandparks to, uh, to speak out about issues that they are, are, that they are confronting with corruption. Uh, there are efforts underway to try and uh, root out corruption and, and most importantly, to rebuild fractured relationships within the park. But it's something that is going to take um, a very, very long time. Uh, and it's going to take a degree of, of commitment. I'll come a lot back to that further. Um, if you look at it, and we've termed this the Wild East, um, it's a, it's a, a comment that uh, was a statement taken from a book about organized crime in Mpumalanga. Um, <clears throat> Mpumalanga's violence and its geographic position set it apart. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, it's, it's uh, position in relation to Mozambique and Eswatini. Uh, we've mentioned the various types of crimes that are, are occurring increasingly often there. Uh, there are criminal syndicates with tentacles that extend to a range of markets. It's not a case where you have syndicates involved in rhino poaching only, but you have syndicates with uh, linkages into cash and transit heists, the taxi industry, other forms of violence. Uh, the late Chief Clyde Amnesi is a good example of that. It's believed his, his assassination was linked to um, a dispute over the spoils from a cash and transit heist. He also was involved in the taxi industry. And he um, has been, uh, he was arrested and was due to go on trial this month on charges linked to an extensive uh, rhino poaching syndicate, which also involved um, Petro Sidney Mabuza, um, a, a significant crime boss, uh, better known by his clan name, Mshengu. Uh, he was assassinated in June 2021. That's his vehicle, the orange pickup truck there. Another figure in that syndicate is Joseph Nyalunga on the bottom right. Uh, a former police officer, and there are a number of former police officers who've been implicated in this case, five of them, including the former station commissioner from Skukuza. So that gives you in a snapshot a, a fairly um, a good idea of, of how these syndicates operate and how they traverse different markets. Corruption remains a key enabler of all of this activity. Um, and I've spoken earlier about uh, some of the assassinations and in Pumalanga, certainly in our most recent report documenting assassinations in South Africa, has seen alarming upticks in assassinations uh, related to organized crime, but also uh, politically. Uh, we come to responses, second last slide. Um, we've looked at this, and this not, does not only apply to the Kruger and the greater Kruger area, but I think in many approaches to, to organized crime in South Africa. Um, policing tactics have, for the most part, been reactive. Uh, and need to be replaced. We need much more strategic approaches, targeted investigations. 
Uh, the investigation, for instance, that was done by DPCI and Pumalanga, coupled with the NPA, Sandparks, and KPMG is one example of that. And the impact of that investigation, and hopefully we'll go forward and see convictions coming from that, um, has, been, has been incredibly encouraging. Uh, targeted investigations identifying high-level actors in the markets that cause the greatest harms. We've seen, for instance, a good example is the case of Big Joe Nyalunga, who's allegedly uh, one of the key figures linked to, to a significant network, poaching network, where action, and he's been arrested three times in connection with poaching cases and has also been arrested in connection with a murder, um, where action has been taken not only through prosecutions that are, are coming up now, but also where the South African Revenue Service um, has become involved and hit him with a tax bill, uh, a significant tax bill, plus uh, most of his assets have been seized. Uh, so coupling asset forfeiture with, uh, with tax investigations and others. Um, it's necessary to build up critical financial investigations and intelligence functions within SAPs, but also strategically within DPCI. Uh, DPCI have demonstrated in the province that they can make inroads into organized crime. We've seen that with some of the investigations into cash and transit heists, but also more recently with the Kruger investigations. Prosecutions of high-level actors and speedy prosecutions. Um, and then, very importantly, within the park, rebuilding morale, rebuilding professionalism and trust among scarf and rangers, providing protections for whistleblowers investigators and prosecutors. And I think that with the, the current leadership in, in, San, in, in, in the Kruger, there are um, efforts underway to do that. Um, but that is going to require a long-term commitment from political leadership, from Sandparks and its board to address those issues uh, in a way that's transparent, fair, swift, and consistent. Um, it's also vital, and there again moves underfoot within Kruger to do this, to implement a transparent and fair integrity management policy. And that is an integrity management policy that goes far beyond simply doing uh, polygraphing uh, with, with all the attendant contro con controversy around that. And importantly, rebuilding a sense of professionalism, trust, uh, and motivation by embedding core values at both the leadership level, but also among staff. I think it's important that this is not something that's seen to be targeting staff only, but that it's something that works across the park um, and, and leadership are bound to, to the same levels of, of and, and are bound to the, to the same uh, processes. Um, there's a need to improve internal communications and to provide ways for staff, particularly rangers, to, to speak out about some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, I've mentioned strategy, um, the possibility of amnesties for low-level actors, uh, again, a controversial idea, but one that should at least be explored, and then creating safe spaces and an independent whistleblowing mechanism. Um, I think that is probably the greatest challenge, and, and it's the one that is going to require the most thought, um, particularly when you have situations where your staff are vulnerable within the park, but also outside the park, where you have cases, for example, where you have criminal networks who double as loan sharking or double, you know, as loan sharks uh, involved in a range of criminal access, uh, of activities, which can give them access to people's financial information through loans, cash loans, um, and that also pinpoints weaknesses. Um, so I think I think there are a number of of areas where uh, where there can be significant improvements made. Um, I think in many ways, the, the greatest weakness currently in the, in the province is policing within many of the communities that are impacted and the absence of, of police. And the police themselves in some of those communities face the same challenges as Sandparks Ranger Corps, where they are exposed, they live in communities that they are meant to police, they're exposed to entrenched organized crime networks and uh, and syndicates. So ultimately, the takeaway for me from from this uh, from this particular research, um, and as I've said earlier, the the report has been circulated, is that there is only so much that can be done within the Kruger Park, um, and I think that there are, are commendable efforts uh, underway at the moment. Hopefully, we'll see uh, positive results coming from those. But there is an urgent need to address the far more broad uh, issue of, of organized crime within the Kruger, which stretches from Barberton and the mines of Barberton and the linkages between those networks. And it's not something that only the DPCI or the NPA can tackle. Um, it's something that is going to require an all of government commitment 
it needs it it requires issues to around um, the socioeconomic conditions in the province to be addressed urgently um, and then uh, a, a broader involvement from from law enforcement agencies um i thank you uh, if there are any questions at this point Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Redemir. Thank you. Thank you very much for a comprehensive uh, report. Uh, honorable members, can I invite you to engage the presentation of Mr. Redemir? I know the hand of Honorable Weber. I also know the hand of Honorable Bryant. Uh, please proceed, Honorable Weber. We'll see if there are other hands that, um, that may come a bit later. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rademeyer, for an excellent report. I think we all are a little bit shocked and maybe, well, not shocked, I'm not shocked, but paralyzed by the information due to the fact that um, we do not have proper enforcement of of dealing with these issues. You just mentioned now from the mines in Barberton right through, now I live in Mpumalanga. So one of the big issues in Barberton town in itself is corrupt not only by these wildlife, but also by the mines, which no one can do anything about. So it's like you said, a parallel, I'm not sure you called it a parallel, but it is a parallel, um, so like a shadow uh, mining companies. They do exactly what a legal one do. They just parallel to them. And this is exactly what is happening. You mentioned that um, there was <laughs> a fall of 75% of run within the Kruger National Park. So this is a very interesting question I'm going to ask, which I'm not sure you can answer, but what is the real figure of existing runners in, 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 the, in the Kruger? It is also scary to see, and I understand it, if someone comes to you and says they're going to kill your wife or your child, they do that to a policeman and to a ranger, which really cares. They really don't really have anywhere to go because they must go to a policeman that they thought that is um, on their side and they're not, and they lose, they do lose of this. What can really be done about that? I, I, I saw you say that there's 16 people arrested my problem is you said there's also no funding. Who's responsible for the funding if you're going to um, a court case and is it the investigation that needs to be done by the police that is needs funded? Why is there no funding for this investigation so we can, can, can actually have some serious convictions here? I think one of the big problems here is also the, 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 the crossover from, 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 from uh, provinces. Um, because in Skakuza court, I quite often go to that. And that is my other question. You mentioned that the station Kumara has also been arrested or being implicated. We said with Skakuza court, that is mostly in the Bushback Ridge area, exactly where you had this, um, this, this, this um, 30 um, mass people going in and blew up everything. Um, so Skukuza court is there. If the station commander is implicated and the Skukuza court takes place in Skukuza, how fair can these outcomes be? Um, I've attended some of them. I've seen some be arrested. I see, see some people really just, they just walk out. And because the system of the cross border, someone that has been implicated twice or three arrested in KZN and they come over to, to Kruger National Park in Pumalanga, there's no reference from that situation and they walk three years as a first timer. Um, how can we maybe uh, better that situation between all of the provincial um, environmental people? Then just my last question, I think, let me just make sure. No, I think for now that is it. Thank you. Uh, just my last question. Um, when you speak about the socioeconomic conditions and 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 um, is it that you mean about the inequality and the poverty of people and therefore they're vulnerable to the syndicate crime, uh, to the crime syndicates in the sense of they will do anything to sort of get money in betraying what is, uh, uh, what is happening there? Then my question, if that is what you mean, is how can you lift up to this socioeconomic uh, 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 problems if the country has such a high rate of poverty and unemployment, and one of the reasons we're there is because of this syndicate crime 
um, and the corruption that we have in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, should I answer those questions quickly or? Chairperson, are you there? Uh, I think we normally, sorry, I think the chair dropped off again. We normally take a couple, so I'll, I'll take the liberty, I think, in the meantime, of just following on. Um, thank you again, Mr. Rodemeyer, um, just to echo the sentiments of uh, my colleague, uh, Honorable Weber. Um, very, very interesting presentation, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, sort of a missing piece of the puzzle in terms of many of the presentations that we've had up until now, um, really speaking to some of those key endemic issues um, uh, in terms of you know what's 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 feeding uh, this this broader network of crime uh, in the Mpumalanga area we have been up ourselves as a committee uh, to visit Kruger and uh, some of the things that you've mentioned um, I think are quite pertinent uh, in terms of our own oversight operations um, up there um, one question that I that I would like to to ask we we've heard recently uh, reports in particular around load shedding and ESCOM um, there was a report I think it was in the Daily Maverick uh, speaking uh, around the connections with the coal mafia in Mpumalanga and spoke to similar uh, networks uh, including cash and transit and I think they mentioned Rhino Horn as well um, and the connections with uh, Mr. Mabuza. Um, uh, I'm talking about uh, Mr. Big uh, Mabuza, uh, the other one, um, the, the, the gent who was, uh, who was assassinated. Um, how uh, much uh, of a link is there between uh, what's taking place with the coal mafia uh, in that area and important political figures and, and, and uh, I know the police, uh, certain police uh, uh, individuals were were implicated as well uh, in, in some of those reports. Uh, how much of a connection is there between that coal mafia um, and the uh, issues relating to rhino uh, horn smuggling and the poaching? Um, then in terms, you mentioned uh, there were issues with, uh, with what you referred to as heavy-handed anti-poaching operations. Um, can you just expand a little bit on what, you, uh, what you're referring to there? Um, uh, uh, in terms of the range of facilities uh, and, you know, how we could be improving those uh, with some of the money that's being spent in the world, but fully agree with you. I mean, we were up there, uh, uh, as I mentioned, on that oversight, and I know many of the members were quite shocked to see some of the conditions that some of the, the, the rangers uh, were, were staying in. Um, it was good to see that there were, some of them were being upgraded, but there was still a long way to go. Um, and, you know, I don't think anybody wants to be spending this money. That said, we are still sitting uh, with 82 vacant ranger posts uh, at Kruger National Park. Only five of them have been managed to, 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 to be filled uh, by Sandbox over the past year. Um, and there's still another 82 that need to be filled and they need budget and all of that as well. So that is a challenge. And obviously, where would you, where would you house them with the, with the current issues they're facing? Uh, where can we get that report that you mentioned from USA and WWF? Is that available online? Um, or if it's not, is it something that could be circulated to the committee? Is it a confidential report? Uh, if you could just expand on that. Um, I think you've, you've made the point quite clear in terms of the breakdown of trust between Sand Parks and Kruger National Park and staff, et cetera. I know it's something that which we've raised on a regular basis. We sometimes met with a, you know, oh, don't worry, everything's, everything's okay. We're, we're working on it. But I think there, there is blatantly a, uh, it, an issue there, and, and I know it's been it's been raised when we've spoken previously around polygraph testing or integrity testing, and trying to find ways to get that balance correct between treating everybody like a criminal, but recognizing the fact that there is endemic corruption taking place in Kruger National Park, and I think that balance is important. And I think following on from that, what you mentioned, your responses, which I think could probably be better summed up as recommendations. Um, at the end of your report, have you made those formally to any members of uh, of, of Sandbox, the board, or, or any of the staff? And if so, uh, what has the response been uh, in terms of those recommendations? And the final point is you've mentioned your work with ISS and Interpol. Um, how much uh, uh, 
work is being undertaken in terms of the end point uh, of, of a lot of this uh, rhino horn, the vast majority of it going to China um, and the connection between our local smuggling syndicates and the uh, uh, Chinese buyers and the Chinese criminal syndicates um, that are operating and functioning um, and what more in your opinion could be done by the South African government and Sandbox and our police to address that. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Honorable Brian, Honorable Ganjo. <clears throat> Thank you, Chaperson. I will request that I switch off my video because I've just experienced load shedding started now at 10 um, for the connectivity. Uh, I would like to switch off my video. Uh, Chair, just two points uh, from the report by Mr. Rademe. Let me appreciate the report. And uh, one, he has mentioned some of the allegations about the uh, employees of um, Sun Parks or Kruger National Park were involved in these uh, crimes. I want to check if there are concrete evidence and also if those are, uh, allegations have been reported to the police and they have been charged. And um, secondly, Chair, we, it is clear here that we are not just dealing with um, the killing of animals and so on and so forth, but you are dealing with a, a, a syndicate. We are dealing with organized crime that deals with drugs, as, as he has already mentioned, uh, human trafficking and all that, 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 that. So for me, I think it is not only uh, us as, as, as the FFE that needs to deal with this matter. We need, or, or sand packs, we need to rope in um, the safety and security class um, so that we can all work together in, try to in trying to resolve this matter. So I would propose that as this committee, we at some point we have to call um, Minister Ukele and uh, the portfolio committee that deals with uh, 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 yeah, safety and security uh, cluster to come. And we afford also um, Mr. Rada Mayor an opportunity to present this so that we can hear from the side of the police, what is it that they are doing in trying to assist um, the challenges that are faced uh, by Mpumalanga and, and, and the community at large. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson. Sebulele, uh, Honorable Kancho, Honorable Mbata. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Julian. I think uh, you have been touched on the, the local strategies, <coughs> uh, community safety, like the your, your CPF, uh, your, the street committees, if there are street committees, because it's a rural area. Uh, on how best uh, uh, this can be uh, controlled and uh, what other assistance. Because let me just give a reference on where I'm staying. We have a lot of crime, um, but what, what we do, we did as a community. We, we decided to get one uh, security company where all the community members agreed to use that security company. And each house, they pop about 300 and something, 335. So for all the crime, because it was the, the, we had the highest crime, for all the crime here, whether there's uh, deliveries uh, and so forth, these security companies, they are accompanying those people and uh, they have the cameras also for surveillance around the, the, the street and we've got the street committees uh, uh, which hold their own meetings with the, the, the relevant uh, security company. So for that, we, uh, we have seen that our crime has, um, has uh, gone down because there was housebreaking, kids couldn't go even to the shops. 
so I, I was, I, I'm just uh, giving uh, some of those information to say, maybe you should also check on, 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 on uh, making sure that the community buy in and they, they pop out to assist because sometimes the police, they are not available 24 seven, but this security company is available 24 seven. They've got the surveillance cameras in all the streets where in our area, because we tried our level best to try and reduce or resolve the issue of crime. And it has, it has an impact now. And we have so many cases where we have, the, as the community, we have uh, um, uh, found ourselves the, 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 the culprits. And then after, we, uh, by the assistant of the security company, and we have handed over, uh, uh, handed uh, them over to the uh, local police stations. I know it's a difficult situation, but please try and look at those uh, smaller Nyana issues that that means that the, the community is buying in now. So it will assist a lot. Thank you. Honorable members, are the further takers? Uh, okay, Mr. Rademeyer, just uh, from my side, um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure you'd agree with me that uh, the the triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and uh, uh, unemployment are significant uh, contributors and drivers uh, of crime. Um, uh, and this this should include in in those national parks. Uh, now, uh, in terms of your research, um, um, and everywhere else you have been, how do these other national parks survive in in, in other countries? Uh, just for example, here next to us in in Zimbabwe, um, how how do they survive? Or, or, or is it safe to conclude that we are the only country that is poor? Uh, it will be very helpful to, for us to uh, copy the, the working modalities uh, and the methodologies that they are that they are, that they are deploying there. <clears throat> but but lastly, uh, the recommendations that you are making uh, to deal with this crime uh, in line with what Honorable Ganjo has proposed. Uh, have you shared them with the law enforcement agencies, particularly the South African police services, uh, to, en to enhance their effectiveness? Um, if you have, what has been their response uh, before we really intervene as a committee to invite the um, uh, uh, minister and uh, the leadership of South African uh, police services? Uh, over to you, Mr. Rademeyer. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me start just quickly with that with that question. We did share the report. In fact, it was launched in White River um, at, an, at a closed event attended by DPCI from the province, uh, Stand Parks and the NPA, um, along with other stakeholders. Um, we've also shared, and I think it, it overlaps quite a bit with, with this report, um, the strategic organized crime assessment that we've done at a national level with the cyber police service, uh, DPCI, and also the, the relevant ministers uh, in, the, in the justice cluster, um, the MPA as well. Um, this particular report hasn't been shared nationally, but the, I think that many of the, the points that we're making in terms of strategic uh, interventions are, are raised in those, in those other reports. Um, but I, I think that there is certainly scope for, for a further discussion and debate there. Um, I think when it comes to other national parks, um, it's extremely difficult. Zimbabwe, you mentioned Zimbabwe. Yes, uh, Zimbabwe has been showing some success, but their national parks have also been under enormous pressure over the years, you know, facing uh, long before South Africa's poaching crisis began, Zimbabwe itself was, was facing an onslaught on, on national parks. And that's ebbed and waned um, over the years. I think that the distinct characteristic that possibly sets us aside, certainly in Southern Africa, um, not so much in, in Central and, and other parts of Africa, but in Southern Africa, 
is the levels of violence that exist in our society and the levels of violent crime that exist in our society. Um, you know, the, the assassinations that take place, not a week goes by without another assassination being reported. I've mentioned the upticks in, in Pumalanga and elsewhere. And I think that is what's really worrying, is that these syndicates, uh, you know, you're looking at cash and transit gangs, you're looking at illegal miners in the Barberton area, you're looking at people involved in a range of criminal activities and very violent criminal activities have entrenched themselves and have metastasized. And you have these almost parallel economies that have become established, um, where the people that you turn to uh, in some communities are not necessarily the state, the support, but you, you know, if you need a loan, if you need support, you turn to the gang bosses. If you need security, if you need protection of your business. Um, and that's really worrying. You know, we've seen that in other provinces too, the Western Cape around, um, you know, with with, with the, the gang economies. Um, so I think that, you know, that for, for us, that is something of very real concern, particularly in a province like Mpumalanga, where you've had this increase in, in, in murder rates over the past decade. Um, if I may, moving on to some of the other questions, um, and I'll try and answer these as quickly as possible. Um, Honorable Weber, uh, referred to Barberton and what could be done in Barberton. Um, certainly, you can see the, the economic impact of, of illegal mining and, and uh, organized crime on, on the community there. Uh, the mines around Barberton have had some success, though, by bringing in external police investigators, both DPCI and also uh, uh, the police task team and other agencies from other provinces to conduct uh, investigations. Um, and that has led to a significant dip in, in illegal mining in those communities, and particularly in areas where there is uh, there are allegations of significant local police corruption and police aiding and abetting um, illegal miners. Um, the Skakuza court, just to clarify, um, the person who was arrested uh, was briefly the, the station commissioner at Skakuza, and then was subsequently moved. I, I speak under correction, but I think it was to Bushbuck Ridge. Um, and that's when the arrest took place. Um, but um, certainly, you know, I think we've seen um, efforts in the past to close down the Skakuza court. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Uh, I think there's, the Skakuza court itself has, has a high um, uh, level of convictions that have taken place and dedicated prosecutors who are, are working there. Um, I think that when... The, the challenge, and this, this dovetails with, with some of the other comments from uh, Honorable Bryant, but I think you know, the challenge is, is where do you invest your money? I think it's quite crucial within Kruger to, to look at the conditions in which rangers operate. I think that a lot of the breakdown in trust, a lot of what can be attributed to the, the general collapse of morale within the park can be attributed to the, the conditions in which uh, which rangers work, their accusations of racism um, that have been leveled uh, by some rangers. There certainly is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, from, a, from a perspective of sort of spatial apartheid, very little has changed in the way that structures run within Kruger. And I think there are now efforts to try and relook at those, to also look at, ben to carry out benchmarking operations, to look at salaries and employment scales. Um, so that's slightly important. Um, the socioeconomic conditions, and this uh, also touches on what the Honourable Chairperson was saying now. Um, yes, the high rates of poverty do play into that, but we also know that, you know, um, they're, just because people are poor doesn't make them criminals. Um, and I think the vast majority of people in those communities are not involved in criminal activity. The problem, though, is that uh, you do have a, a subset, and it's a powerful subset with access to weapons who can instill fear in communities where there's very little option. You know, who do you turn to um, in a community when your local police station has been corrupted, when uh, you can't rely on police reacting uh, to, to, those, to those issues, and where you're not seeing any real impacts uh, when arrests do take place or prosecutions take place or when investigations take place. Um, Honorable Bryant mentioned ESCOM, load shedding, um, and links to the coal mafia. Um, in our experience, and certainly there are some indications of some elements from that are involved in the coal mafia, also involved in other organized crime, from cash and transit heists, some linkages to, to rhino horn trafficking networks, poaching networks. But we tend to 
look at organized crime ecosystems within South Africa. And the argument that we make in our strategic organized crime risk assessment is that there are multiple overlapping criminal ecosystems. And it's not a case of people working these days primarily in one sort of illicit economy. Um, you know, for example, you'll have Barberton's a good example where there was a crackdown on illegal mining. Um, but where um, similarly with the decline in poaching levels in the south of the Kruger National Park, some poachers have uh, have turned to providing protection for illegal miners. Um, there was an incident when I was doing research where a hunting rifle was used to fire shots at mine security, and there were there was some suspicion that that rifle may have emanated from from poachers. So these are constantly shifting illicit markets and new opportunities. You know, if you stop one axis of illicit income, people still need to earn an, uh, earn an income. Um, I Right, if we've got, there's also a couple of questions here um, <clears throat> around the vacant posts within, uh, within sand parks. There is a strong argument to be made that currently is probably not the right time to be filling posts in sand parks until there's some stability. Uh, certainly some of the subjects that I interviewed described the current working environment um, as toxic um, and that that employing staff at this particular time before efforts to address that can gain ground uh, would itself um, be self-defeating. Um, certainly, I think, again, one needs to again look at, at the conditions in which rangers work. Uh, you yourselves have visited the park and seen that and how that can be addressed. Um, the USAID report is an internal report uh, that was done for Sand Parks with support from WWF. Um, the, uh, the reports, the recommendations in our report have been shared widely with Sand Parks uh, and with the, the Kruger National Park. Um, I believe that they have also been um, shared at board level. Um, then, uh, sorry, just moving on, I'm hopefully not missing too many questions here. Honorable Gansho asked if there's concrete evidence. Um, certainly in the investigation where there have been 16 arrests done, uh, the prima facie evidence is, is, seems quite overwhelming in terms of linkages, payments made to corrupt actors within the park by criminal networks, uh, bank accounts set up in the names of, of family members or in the names of children, uh, shelf companies. Uh, there's a lot that's been unraveled there, and certainly with the with the early arrests that took place, and that overnight decline in poaching, uh, where it where it dropped from fairly high levels to no incidents in three months, show that that these kinds of operations can have an impact. Um, I think DPCI have been very involved in that process, and I think DPCI in the province have been very involved and collaborative with Sand Parks and with the Kruger National Park. Uh, and working on investigations, uh, along with the police stock theft unit. Um, and the SAP stop, stock theft unit based within Kruger um, has also been very effective. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done in communities around the, the Kruger, uh, where we've seen this metastasizing of, of organized crime and, and other issues. Um, Honorable Mbato raised a very important point around street committees, uh, and security companies and, and communities taking on their own uh, levels of security and addressing those. And I think that that certainly is a vital component, um, particularly in, in areas where you have an absence of law enforcement. But there is also so, only so much that can be done. We've seen cases, for instance, where um, street committees are intimidated, uh, where, uh, you know, where you do have uh, violent criminal networks that are entrenched. Um, and they themselves, in many cases, might not have the same protections as you could have if you had a dedicated law enforcement focus uh, on targeted investigations, looking into the networks that are terrorizing communities. Um, but I do think that that is an important component. It's an important component everywhere in South Africa where people you know, have the ability to, to do that. Um, certainly not all communities can afford cameras and, and, and uh, security uh, guards uh, on patrol. Um, and that in itself raises a challenge and, and helps to deepen inequalities in many cases in South Africa. Um, I'm not sure if I've missed any other questions that were asked, Honorable Chair, but uh, if, if I have left you on out, please feel free to, to shout.
Honorable Bryant, followed by Honorable Zamini. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, there was just one or two things uh, that I think uh, just, just requiring a response on. Just, just the first one, I see you mentioned that the that USAID report was an internal report. I'm assuming that means that it is confidential and won't be, you won't be able to share that, uh, if you can just confirm that. Um, and then the one question that I did ask was in terms of Interpol's involvement and your uh, dealings in terms of feedback with regards to the Chinese markets and the Chinese yes. smuggling syndicates and how that feeds in. Um, and then just, just, just again on that point of the coal mafia, um, I mean, have you found or has there been any inference of the involvement of senior political figures um, in the horn trade in the same way as has been alleged with the coal mafia? Um, it is sad to hear. Secondly, in terms of the, this toxic work environment you mentioned at KNP, it is something we have heard previously um, and, and that needs to be addressed. And then just chairperson, uh, perhaps as an aside, um, I know Sandbox is on the meeting. Um, I wonder if they would want to, to make a response um, after Mr. Rodemeyer um, to, to some of the issues that have been raised. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable Bryant. Honorable Zamin. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I just want to make some follow up, if probably they were not mentioned. One, I don't see the analysis about the stealing of cars, because what actually happened of stealing of vehicles, what actually happened now is that now there's a lot of these chop chop shops, in particular of stealing the parts. To me, I think it is increasing because they are able to say that now the transportation of the full vehicle therefore is costly for them. Now they're dealing with, now with this thing of chop shop shops where actually now they are selling directly the parts. So if maybe we can be able to get that kind of now of the analysis. The second one, on the health sector, these bogus doctors that are taking place in doing operations to human bodies and all that, stealing the organs. Because now to some of other areas, you'll find that now they will rush on a question and they're working closely with the people on mortuaries where actually they steal this kind of an organs. For some of other people now, they don't want to do any post-mortem based on that thing that the organs are being stolen. The last point that is disturbing me uh, a little bit, Chair, under organized corruption, I'm not sure it's deliberate or it is not deliberate. Why is mentioned when we speak about corruption we speak about one person, the leader, and you even mentioned like Jacob Zuma. Is it not okay? Just simple say, corruption under the state capture, this is what actually happened. That now to single eight persons and by the name and say, in fact, now the person under this leadership of this person, as if in fact now corruption is started from his era. It didn't happen to any other things. I think it's find, I find it very much disturbing to me that now we can't be able to do and demoralize or demonic any person who's doing that kind of a thing. Therefore, I'm appealing to say that now this presentation, it should not be able to, to be personal. It should be able to be an overview that will be able to take place and make sure that now we talk about things that are happening than just to personalize it to any certain individual. It was going to be enough for me to say, under the state of state capture report or whatever it is, therefore you speak about reports, the name of people and not have been mentioned on that state of report. But now I want to single it out. I find it very, very bad and disturbing to me. Thank you very much. So honorable Zamin, honorable Winkler. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to um, Mr. Rademeyer. I'd like to know, has there been any response by Sandpox um, and the department um, with regard to the report? Um, because I, I assume that this was sent to the various applicable authorities. 
Um, and has there been any consultation with yourself and these agencies um, on how we can collaborate in terms of the information that you've brought forward and proposed solutions and whether the department and um, Sandpox has been willing to take these recommendations on board um, and perhaps uh, draft some sort of plan, um, a management plan to deal with this endemic corruption and uh, the numerous other issues that you have highlighted in the report. Thank you. Mr. Ready, Mayor. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, all right, let me just begin with Honorable Bryant. Um, yes, the report is is confidential. Um, so I think any, any inquiries in that are probably best uh, directed to Sandparks. With regard to the, the Chinese market, um, we under this project haven't recently done work. I've done quite extensive work myself over the past 10 years looking at linkages between rhino horn trafficking uh, in, in Africa and also in Asia, uh, notably Vietnam and China. Um, I would say that from the uh, that you know much of the market these days seems to be in China. Uh, Certainly, uh, there have been some efforts to do investigations. I think there's a lot more that could be done there. There has been some encouraging signs uh, in recent years, although disrupted somewhat by the pandemic, of collaboration uh, between South African and other law enforcement agencies and counterparts uh, in the People's Republic of China. Um, you've also asked if uh, high-level political officials uh, are implicated in uh, rhino poaching. Um, there are many allegations that do the rounds. Uh, hard evidence is hard to come by. Um, you know, there have been suggestions of some political figures at a, at a more lower level um, who are implicated in that. I, I think it's it's um, it's a tricky one to to assess, particularly given the the climate that one sees in a province like Mpumalanga, where you do have. Um, you know, for instance, the investiga an investigator in a significant rhino poaching case being assassinated. There is, you know, a, a climate of fear to some degree. And I think that there's a reluctance to probe too deeply um, very often when it comes to powerful figures. Um, so, you know, that that in itself. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to a comparison sort of the coal mafia and those linkages, uh, you know, probably um, not not quite on the on, on the same level. Um, if we move on, uh, Honorable Lamini, you mentioned the theft of cars and chop shops, certainly also an issue uh, in that province and the movement of cars across borders. Uh, one of the people allegedly involved in, uh, in a network that we profile in the report and is, who is due to stand uh, trial uh, soon, uh, a former police officer was also implicated in moving stolen vehicles uh, across the border, which um, allegedly was the reason for his uh, his leaving the police. Uh, we've also seen cases with vehicles moving, and I'm sure you, you're aware of these, of, of vehicles being moved across the border uh, through Eswatini. Um, I unfortunately know very little about uh, organ theft cases and, and uh, uh, bogus doctors. So I'd, I'd be the wrong person to comment on that. Um, I think your concern, certainly uh, the question around naming people, um, I, I, I take what you mean there. And I think that certainly what the report tries to show is that issues that we're dealing with with corruption in Mpumalanga long predate the province even coming into, into existence. Uh, there's a section in the report which tries to trace to some degree the history and the challenges um, that Mpumalanga faces as a province and how you know some of the issues around corruption uh, okay, that that the province is still wrestling with today, and the roots of that corruption um, predate the the formation of Mpumalanga in 1994, um, and date back to uh, apartheid homelands and other linkages and issues around uh, the the homeland police and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd be I I would refer you to that section of the report. I think that where we have also identified people by name in terms of criminal networks that have involved. I think that has been necessary in this report to try and extend exp to demonstrate the reach and the impact also that um, political figures have um, and issues that have occurred on their watch uh, on on the the growth and the spread of, of organized crime um, and issues around law enforcement capacity to deal with that. Um, 
Honourable Winkler, um, uh, we uh, have discussed the report with officials in the Kruger National Park. Certainly Sand Parks um, issued a statement following the release of the report, report saying that they they welcome the, uh, the, the findings of the report and the recommendations. Um, and, you know, in my experience, I've seen um, uh, a willingness, um, certainly a, a, a very encouraging willingness on the part of Sand Parks to discuss these issues far more openly than in the past um, and, and a willingness to try and, and deal with them. Um, obviously, it's an enormous challenge um, and it's something that is going to require uh, political support um, for the people who are trying to affect change and trying to turn things around. Um, not sure if there's anything I've left out there, Honourable Chair. Honourable Winkler, is that the legacy end? Yes, apologies. Honourable Zamin. Chair, I still want to insist. Mm -hmm. The report says that now, even before 1994 and prior to 1994, therefore a lot of corruption has taken place. Now, but the report is only mentioning a one person. Therefore, I'll say without a debate and all these other issues, I'll say, let's remove the name of any individuals that are there and speak about the report. Once now you start to, to zoom into any individuals as well, there are no facts that are taking place around there. It's just a question of insinuation to say it happened and all that. Thing. It's going to create problem to some of us. In particular, where actually you find that now there is no evidence so far up to now. Therefore, I'll say let the report is good, but let's not mention the names of the people. Let's just talk about the report and its content that now to say there is this kind of people. What's if we check how many administrations did we have? We have the Mandela administration, we have the Tabum Begis administration, we have the Zuma administration, we have uh, uh, Montlantes administration, we have the Ramaphosa administration now that is still on. But now I don't think it is fair. Therefore, I am appealing. Let's not use the names of the people in any report like this. Thank you. Harold <laughs> Bryant. Thanks, thanks, Chairperson. Um, Chair, I think we, we obviously wouldn't be able to amend Mr. Rodimer as a report. It's, it's his report and we have invited him as, as a guest. Um, so obviously he would take that into consideration himself. Um, I personally don't see an issue with it. Um, I, he's, he's, speaking, he's speaking around, around facts and, and, and historical issues. I don't think he has a political agenda. But Chair, my, my question is just in terms of... Um, whether we can we can request sand parks to to respond um, after this because I think there are a lot of very important issues that have been raised and I think we should give them the opportunity uh, to respond to some of those issues uh, if possible chairperson thank you thank you very much uh, honorable Brian honorable uh, Mbata. thank you chair I think um I will agree with what uh, Honorable uh, uh, Lamini has said, because also on the pictures, I saw the picture of one of the uh, leaders in uh, Pumalanga, unless there is a proof that it, it, that's what happened. But for now, because uh, there is no evidence uh, or there's no criminal charges, let's not uh, try to implicate uh, members uh, who haven't been uh, trialed. So I will agree with what Comrade uh, uh, Honorable Zamin Mantla Zamini is saying. Thank you. Ms. Yago, what is that end for? Chair, um, if you wanted us to say something, it was just a, a in case you wanted us, you, we'll, 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 we'll wait for your ruling. Okay, no, no, that's fine. That's fine, Ms. Yago. Uh, at the right time, remember you are part of the agenda items. Uh, you will you will get an opportunity to to respond. We just make we just need to make a ruling on uh, on this matter. Honorable members, remember we invited Mr. Rademeyer 
to come and make a presentation to us. Now, this is his report, and we did not give him his guidelines. We did not give him guidelines on what to encapsulate in the report. Now, if he makes allegations, because this meeting is a public meeting, in, and if Mr. Radimea, uh, uh, if there are people who feel Mr. Radimea must be sued for defamation of character or anything of that sort, that, will, that can be done. Uh, those people can pursue Mr. Radimea. But uh, this is his findings. Whether that's substantive or not, it is not for us to make that determination. So that is the ruling. We accept this report as it is, and it is a matter of public scrutiny. If it's a matter that Mr. Radimea needs to clarify with the people that uh, he thinks are implicated, um, it's a matter that can be pursued outside the jurisdiction and scope of this particular meeting. Uh, with regards to sun parks, if there are issues that you feel you want to respond to, at the right time, when we give you an opportunity to make a presentation, you will speak to how far uh, the issues Mr. Radimea is raising are correct or incorrect at the right time. So that is how we move. Mr. Radimea, you want to take a last bite? Um, thank you, Honourable Chair. No, uh, just to say thank you very much for, for inviting me today um, and my appreciation to, to the Honourable Members.